الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All praises due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى And we ask Allah to exalt the mention We ask him to grant peace and send his blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all those who follow him on his righteous path until the day of reckoning. Welcome, brothers and sisters, for another episode. I am your host, Abu Mus'ab Wajdi Akkari. With me today is Dr. Mamdouh Muhammad. Welcome, Dr. Sheikh Asim al-Hakim and Sheikh Salim al-Amri. Pleased to have you here with us in the studio. We'll be discussing or continuing our discussion on the characteristics of the da'iya, the one who invites to Islam. And we had heard some beneficial points in regards to distinguishing between the, the by definition and the, that every Muslim, in a sense, is a da'iya and therefore needs to gather the qualities according to whatever Allah facilitates so that he can be involved in this blessed work. We did not discuss all of the characteristics. We will make an effort to address as many as Allah facilitates. So let's take it from that point. We spoke about sincerity, and we coupled that with being persevere and realizing that results are not in our hands. We spoke also about patience, about compassion, gentleness, kindness, and sincerely caring for the other person. I did want us to, even if it's briefly, elaborate on the language based on the ayah وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ We have not sent a messenger except that he spoke the same language as his people so he may clarify for them. The language seems to have an effect in regards to besides the sincerity and the other thing in regards to conveying the message from point A to point B. What are your valuable inputs on this particular issue? I think this is a very valid point and, and we can see it. There is no way no person can succeed if you go to, for example, Indonesia and Malaysia and you can make da'wah and you don't understand the language of the people there. So how can you communicate with them? So it's almost impossible that you can communicate effectively with the people without perfecting their language. And uh, this perhaps requires from us even to think ahead. We need some schools for our children to prepare them to be da'iyah, to teach them the language the other languages like the Urdu language or the uh, uh, Malay language, whatever language, or Chinese now, this is the language of the future. Spanish. And Spanish as well. Habla Espanol. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, and part of knowing the language is knowing the culture, because the language itself does not work without knowing the culture itself, because many times you may use a statement or a way of expressing yourself that uh, you hear from people, oh, you're using an old language <laughs> that has been almost perished or something like that. So, knowing a da'iyah who knows the language of the people well, can communicate effectively with them and if he knows the details of the culture, it would be very good because he can communicate well. I remember that in one time there was a conference that was held in the USA and the universities were there. Each university was introducing itself to get people to honor. And each university had five minutes on the stage to... And um, this was uh, done in Indonesia, by the way. And all these 18 universities there, the representative, one of them came and he started speaking the first two sentences in Indonesian language. And after the presentation, we found that all the Indonesian people went towards the university that spoke few Indonesian languages, which tells you the impact of the language. When you know the language, people feel familiar with you, so they are more listening to you. And the possibility of the success of your mission is much better than if you don't know or you don't. I'm not even saying just knowing the language. I would say perfecting the language. Now, since we're speaking, sorry for interrupting, but let's say the format now or the language which we are involved in is English. And perhaps most of our viewers, you know, be, since they are English speakers, therefore they're listening to this, yeah. watching this show. Let's try to restrict that to the English language. Is first, perhaps one of the two brothers can elaborate on this. Is there, like, okay, we know there's medical English, business English, and, you know, this, the regular English for, you know, communication, conversational English. 
Is there like a category of English that is da'wah English, da'wah terminology, uh, particular words that the da'ya should be aware of to convey the message properly, specifically to people of other faith, where words have connotations, or is it all mumbo jumbo kind of thing? Alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulullah wa ala aliyah sahbihi min wala hama ba'd. No doubt that the knowing the tongue of the people whom you are communicating to is very essential very essential because it has psychological impact the moment you speak in my mother tongue we link immediately i feel you are close to me okay so that's the old terminology linking now they call it we connect we connect okay <laughs> so i feel that we our hearts are close to each other they are attached so this is the the beauty about it so mastering whatever international language is an example only there are other languages which are very important and the people who speak this language they are in great multitude so as dies okay we are talking we need to master such languages okay and prepare the dies and preferably if the dies are from such places are from so they can add the cultural thing exactly along with the language, exactly right. because you have to know the cultural context okay because for example if i am an arab and I don't know the culture, and I don't actually know the language itself and the, the philosophy of the language itself. I might be just translating from, one, from Arabic in the background. I'm thinking Arabic, and then I'm... So the one who's listening, what this guy is saying, yes, it sounds English, but... Are you empty? Okay, <laughs> are you empty? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so you need, as a, as a da'i, you have to be equipped very well. So you have to elevate the level of your culture by reading, by knowing the people. I'm going to give a talk in this country. What are the customs? What are the traditions? What I should say? What I should not say? Right. Okay? Familiarize yourself. Even the people who are inviting you, they should highlight this to you. These areas, don't approach them. Don't use this word. Don't use that. For example, now some people who might become offended if you say black sheep. They say you are racist. Though it is English, it's very important. And English in particular, it is progressing rapidly. In their web, this is a commercial <laughs> in bbc.com. You can go there and see, keep updating your English. And the English you see, amazing. There's a new verb. Otherwise, you will not know, you will not be able to communicate, especially with the youth. I remember in one of my talks, I mentioned hadith of the Prophet and one of the brothers, he said, oh, that is wicked. He said, that is wicked. My English is Victorian. Wicked, I said, behave yourself. What he meant, it is good, cool. He said, understand. So unless we know, we will not be able to communicate. So mastering the language is very important. Sheikh Asim, the da'wah terminology. Well, before going to doubt terminology, it is essential that we know the culture. Because sometimes you may go to a country that speaks English, but the English is different to what you know. And sometimes you're addressing people, you should use the particular language that they understand. So if I go to a medical college, a college of medicine, I would not use the same words I use in a high school. Someone comes up to me, in the States and says, uh, Sheikh, I have a question. I say, go ahead. He said, I smoked a homie yesterday. What should I do? He says, ask Allah for forgiveness. Smoking is haram. By smoking a homie, he, it means that he killed a, one of his people in the hood. So if you don't understand what he's saying, you say, no, he's smoking is bad for you. But this homie, I don't know what brand is it. Also, the terminology is essential. The level is essential. So when you talk to people who are intellectual and, and educated, you use what they understand and you use what appeals to them more than what you would normally use with people who are not so professional. And that is why a doctor would be the best person to address physicians if he's a dad, because he knows where they're coming from. But if you bring someone who comes from a different country and does not know the culture and he needs it to translate for him, this adds insult to, injury. insult to injury. So this is quite important. As for the terminology, definitely a da'i has to have the basics 
to explain. So many times we find the brothers who give da'wah, they quote a hadith and they move on without translating it. Assuming that everybody in the masjid or in the Islamic center or who's watching, he should, he knows it. So, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ So, and he goes on. Okay, what did you mean by إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ So, he has to have the ability to translate it. Not everyone knows what Iman is. So, you have to say it's belief. Not everyone knows what Jannah is. So, you have to translate it into a garden or paradise and so on. So, when you are addressing something in your mind, always I think it is essential to have a mini-me present, watching me, and telling me, listen, I didn't understand this. So there's a small person, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong, but this is what I usually do when I address, when I make a khutbah, when I make a lecture, I usually I mean, make awesome junior sit there, and whenever I say something that is inappropriate or something that needs clarification, he signals for me. Yes, why? Because it is extremely important to have a good impact. Because I am representing Islam, I'm not representing myself. So the terminology is common, Quran, the Sunnah, the prophetic saying. If you're saying things that are related to namaz, for example. People by namaz meaning? Salah. Salah. This is not English and this is not Arabic, but it is there. So we have to yani, know exactly what they mean when it comes to Islamic terminologies. Zakumullah khair for sticking around and we'll be back shortly, inshallah. Regarding duties, the Prophet وسلم, said, whoever sleeps over a prayer or forgets it, he must pray it as soon as he remembers it. There are no expiations other than that. Putting queries. How to offer salah while traveling? Can a woman travel without a mahram? Is it true that actions are based upon intention? Taking responsibilities. To answer all your questions and queries, join me in Umdat al Ahkam. Let's ponder the bestowed knowledge to approach the correct Islam. Join Asim Al Hakim in Umdatul Ahkam every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday at 10:30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 11:30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Why the West is coming to Islam? Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Whether it be atheism, secularism, Marxism, communism, westernism, Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. Islam is not a religion only for the West, it's a religion for the whole of humankind. Dr. Zakir Naik speaks on why the West is coming to Islam in Truth Exposed starting from this Monday at 9 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 10 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. If I were to ask you about the life of our beloved Prophet wasallam, about the incidents that occurred before his prophethood and in Mecca and in Medina, about the names of his loved ones and his wives and his children, how much would we be able to know? How many incidents have we memorized? Brothers and sisters, isn't it more important that we study the seerah of the most important human being who ever walked the face of this earth? Join me, your host Yasser Qadli, as we discuss the most important biography of the most illustrious human being that ever lived, the seerah of our beloved Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Join Yasser Qadli in Seerah of the Prophet Peace be upon him every Saturday at 10 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 11 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu salamu ala Rasulillah. Let's go up a level, okay? There are basic terms which most Muslims are familiar with, at least if they speak English. So we know salah, prayer, zakat giving and paying of alms or giving of alms, charity, different words are used. Is there a level above that? 
And are there books or dictionaries that are available in the market for those who wish to advance? Is this something that people actually get involved in? Are there books, you know, or, or people that specialize in translating Islamic terminology from Arabic to English? Because it's a very sensitive issue, the issue of translation and the usage of terms. Because of the connotation, just to throw one out there, the term, for example, holy. I know this is a controversial one. But, I mean, can you imagine a Muslim maybe addressing Christians? And he keeps saying, the holy prophet said, the holy prophet said, the holy prophet said. And the truth is, it could be that among these, the audience, in their mind, holy is divine. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Ghost. And so holy prophet, in their mind, they already have the misconception that, you know, Muslims worship a box in the desert and Muslims worship Muhammad, alayhi salam. So this may actually be endorsing this idea while you're trying to convey the da'wah of Tawheed. It may backfire. The usage of terms may backfire. So do you know of anyone who took it up a notch in terms of terminology? Is this something that we should be concerned about or is this just kind of blowing things out of proportion? What do you think? I think it is. But uh, the way to solve it is when you try to explain each term that you say. For example, most of the people now, when they try to translate the word Salat, they would say prayer, which does not really give the exact meaning of the Salat that we do. So all the time, because we are introducing something new to the people, so we have to just pay attention to the terms that we use and we explain them to the people. We all the time tell them that because prayer is one du'a. form of our du'a. salah. It's du'a, 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 supplication. Du'a. And it, it's type of, of communication with Allah, which is, I call it monologue, whereas the salat itself is, is different. So we need to explain this because there is no other way. Because even if we say these terms, when we translate them very well, they may be different from one culture into another. When you go to uh, New Zealand, where it's different from when you go to the USA. So the safest thing is to explain the terms to the people. Dr. Mamdu, I'm assuming that you mean when addressing the non-Muslims. Because... Uh, yeah, uh, you know, da'wah is, da is mainly to the non-Muslims, mainly. No, oh, no, it's uh, da'wah. We can differ. We, it is, it's of for course. Muslims, but, but and then, no I'm, doubt. I'm asking but, now, you're addressing Muslims, okay? Is it possible that every time you want to speak of Salah, you, you say prayer begins with takbirat al-ihram, it ends with taslim, or is that something that is understood by the masses? If it is understood, that's fine. So, so yes. you skip it and you move yes, on? You skip okay, it. Okay, so whenever there's but, need. Yeah, whenever there's need. Okay. Yes, you're okay. right. Fair enough. Because even among the Muslims, when the Sheikh, for example, talked about the different types of, you mentioned it earlier in the previous episode, there are four types of uh, sunan. Sunan, so... Uh, not every Muslim would understand these terms. You see what I'm yes, saying? Not every Muslim, even he knows your language, Arabic, he doesn't know the, because these are terms. They should be explained to them. So we have to bear this in mind when we invite people to him. But I wanted to move a little bit towards the Sheikh was saying, the example of the Prophet wasallam, that we should follow as having compassion and love for the people and mercy for them. Uh, the example that he mentioned when he was in Taif and when he was asked by the angel of mountains that he would collapse, yes, the two mountains on their head, in other words, to kill them. The Prophet وسلم, of course, did not accept this. Even he asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make their descendants, yes, of those who worship Allah. And uh, this showed us a very important issue is the vision of the Prophet He was not judging the situation that was in front of him. He was looking forward for something very far, the vision. Let's do it far. And that's what we exactly the quality of the da'is that I want to focus on, is that we should have vision because we've seen some da'is who would go to a country now and he would behave as if he's not coming back. So. <laughs> So he would, <laughs> he would be very, very tough and he, doesn't, and he doesn't have a vision. He doesn't know that he's putting the, the basis or the foundation for all the Muslims who would come after them. So at least if you don't achieve success, at least be very gentle with people, open the door. But we've seen many examples who 
don't have the vision. This is one quality of the da'iyah. Farsighted. Farsighted. He is not working for himself. He's working for the, this whole religion. Excellent. So this is a thing that we need to have this. We need to develop our vision. You're going to New York to make da'wah. You're going to Japan, Tokyo to make da'wah. You have to prepare the stage for all the people who are coming after you. You have to look forward that, okay, you may expect in Japan in the coming 10 years, perhaps few people would be Muslims, but you have to prepare yourself for that. After 200 years, perhaps millions of people will be Muslims. So you need to have a vision and to think with far-sighted eyes, inshallah, and this would help. Uh, the Mr. Hasim, your comment, we haven't discussed knowledge. We touched upon it, ala basira, that upon insight, upon sure knowledge, but perhaps we can address this issue a little more extensively. Definitely, we are in great need of this characteristic in a day, because sincerity comes first, definitely knowledge comes second. If you're gonna call people, what are you going to call them to? See, if you don't have an objective, you'll reach nowhere fast. And those who without knowledge, they'll reach a place that is undesirable because you're gonna call people and you're gonna teach them and you're gonna inject in them wrong understandings that may be difficult, if not impossible, to remove later on. So it is extremely important that the da'i to be knowledgeable. So don't call people to something unless you have knowledge in. How about an evidence for that? Can you recall an evidence from the Quran which in supports this? Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, well, this is one, to call people on correct vision and knowledge. And also Allah Azza wa Jal says to his prophet, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ First of all, know, acknowledge that there is no God worthy of being worshipped except Allah Azza wa Jal. وَاسْتَغْفِرْ لِذَنْبِكَ وَلِلْمُنِينُ وَمِّنَاتِ That afterwards, after you acquire the knowledge, then you may act upon it and seek forgiveness for yourself and for the believers as well. And that is why in the Bukhari, he said that Bab al-ilm qabl qawl wal amal al qawl wal wal amal. This is the first thing you do. It is you acquire knowledge, and this is logical. If I don't have any knowledge about prayer, how would I call people to pray? If my knowledge is distorted, if my knowledge is incomplete, I may teach them something that may stick with them till the end of time, and it's strong. And it's instead dangerous. Of, I'll be getting all the sins. Now, they're not sinful because they're acting upon whom they thought was knowledgeable. But it is extremely dangerous for me to say something without being sure or authentic, because otherwise I'm going to bear the consequences. Perhaps the end of the ayah, that among the things which Allah made forbidden, the end of it, وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Say about Allah that which you have no knowledge of. But I don't want this to be a barrier for those people who don't have knowledge. It should be an ongoing job for the da'ya. All the time you want to increase the amount of knowledge that well, we have. Yes, if I'm interrupted, Dr. Yes. I did not mean that someone yeah. has to acquire all the knowledge. Yeah, no I, that, I wanted to clarify this to yeah. the audience because we said that every Muslim by default is a da'ya. So you invite people to the thing that you know, at least even if it is a very small thing. One ayah, you, one ayah, one ayah. you understand it, you ask scholars about it until you are sure of it, and then you share it with others. So knowing your limits, everybody should yeah, know, know his your own limits. limits. But at the same time, this is an encouragement and a message for every da'iyah to try his best or her best to increase her knowledge or his knowledge. Sometimes I think that even if you do not understand conveying a verse or a hadith, you may convey it to someone who understands this more Better, than you. Yes. As in the hadith, may Allah Azza wa Jal beautify the face of a believer who hears something from me and conveys it to someone else. And subhanAllah, maybe the one who it is conveyed to more knowledgeable than the one who's conveying it. We actually are towards the end of the time. I apologize. And uh, as for the viewers, Zakumullah khair for your patience. And we hope that you have benefited from what you have heard. And we ask Allah to make us benefit from what we have heard. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.